Describe the feeling. It's just nothing I've ever felt before. On a bleak and barren landscape. It's just horrifying, entirely. Halfway around the world. It's just unimaginable. It just makes me want to be a better person. You'll find the killing fields of World War II. It's much more jarring when you're here looking at it up front and it's in your face and it's just, it's just like you're looking around and, and you just don't, it's just unbelievable. Crumbling concentration camps. People were trapped. They were trapped against their will. With walls still stained from poison, where 11 million men, women, and children were exterminated. Where was God when everybody was walking here and they were taking them to burn them? Where was God? 70 years have passed since the Holocaust. I'm crying all the time. But for those few who made it out of these death camps alive, memories are still frozen in time. Good evening, I'm Jeremy Hubbard, coming to you tonight from near the town of Lublin, Poland. This is the Majdanek concentration camp, site of one of the ugliest chapters in human history. A death factory where tens of thousands of people were executed. The place remains largely intact from the barbed wire to the barracks to the guard towers off in the distance. It's been said that every square inch of this camp is covered in blood. And now, more than 70 years later, the few people who made it out of here alive are even fewer in number, which is why we've come back here now to tell their stories. No matter who visits a place like this, they always make the same mistake trying to understand why it happened, why millions were pulled from their homes and families and brought to places like this to be murdered. It is a pointless endeavor. All we can do now is revisit the memorials left behind in their honor. And remember, those places we learned about in history class and the numbers forever attached to them. Majdanek. Sobibor. Treblinka, Auschwitz, there is no way to stare at the rooms full of stacked shoes, thousands of them worn by those killed, and not be changed by the lingering strong smell of the leather soles as if they'd just been slipped off. No way to stare through this peephole and not be changed. The Gestapo's tiny window to make sure everyone inside this gas chamber had collapsed and died. They were crammed in, and it's not like they put a few people in at a time. They just shoved as many as they could. It's just the most horrifying way to kill people. Let our fate be a warning to you, is what those words translate to. They're etched on the dome that covers a massive urn filled with the ashes of Holocaust victims. Yeah, be, just being here really, really, really hit, um, hits hard. I, you know, you come in expecting to feel certain things and then you can feel something totally different. So it's, everyone has a different experience. We traveled to Poland with a Denver-based charity, the Greatest Generations Foundation, on a World War II research mission to document and film the places that suffered most under the Nazis, the places where so many died. It sticks like a splinter under a nail. Including Walter Plywaski's parents. My vengeance is that I am alive, my children are alive, my grandchildren are alive. Plywaski is 86 years old now and lives in Boulder, but as a third grader, his nightmare began. A little boy who somehow survived six concentration camps saw the absolute unimaginable. And his toughest memory of it all? Not being able to say goodbye to my mother. He last saw his mother right here on the train platform at Auschwitz. They'd ridden here in a crammed railroad cattle car, 80 people stuffed inside on a two and a half day long train ride. We're on the arrival platform, just out of cattle cars, and the order came, 
out, women left, men right, and I didn't run to say goodbye because I already knew what was going on. What was going on was the same thing that happened to so many women upon arrival. They were separated from the men and older children and immediately sent to their death. Even all these years later, he can't escape the feeling of death, a feeling that pervades every square inch of this death camp. Nowhere is that feeling felt more than it is here inside the crematorium at the Auschwitz I concentration camp. When the 1.1 million people who died here were either shot or hanged or gassed, this is where they met their fate, inside 800 degree ovens that burned their remains. Losing his mother here at the most notorious of all concentration camps wasn't the end of it. He actually watched three months later as his dad was murdered by a concentration camp leader. The commandant grabbed a shovel and beat him over the head with it. His father, Max Plywaski, had yelled insults to the commandant. He did it on purpose. Walter says it was his dad's way of killing himself. But on his own legs and proud. He didn't let him do it. It is so difficult to imagine living after seeing something like that, much less surviving the starvation, hard labor, and disease that surrounded he and his brother for the next five months as they were moved from one death camp to the next. For those who did last any length of time here at the concentration camp, the living conditions were just deplorable. This is a barracks designed to sleep about 250 inmates per night, but on some nights they'd crammed 750 into this small room, some sleeping on the floor, some with no mattresses at all. In their striped uniforms, they laid here, awaiting death. You were daily selected for extermination or not? But Walter Plywaski would soon taste freedom. In April 1945, as the Dachau extermination camp was being liberated, a bomb blast shorted out the electricity on the barbed wire fences, and Walter and his brother made a run for it. Blue sparks. When we took off across a potato field. Eventually, they were captured by a U.S. field infantry patrol who gave them their U.S. military uniforms to wear and more importantly, gave them their freedom. That's how we became U.S. Army mascots. Weighing just 90 pounds and completely alone, Walter eventually snuck on board a boat bound for the U.S. And years later, he would make for himself a life in Boulder, Colorado, where a few years back, he was awarded the Knight's Cross of Merit from the president of Poland for everything he endured in that country during the Holocaust. But sadly, his suffering wasn't over quite yet. In 2010, his home of more than 30 years was destroyed in the Four Mile Canyon fire above Boulder. I woke up to total destruction. He told us at the time this devastation was actually not that big a deal. I mean, look, it no longer looks what it was. When you've had a past like Walter Plywaski, even some of the most devastating life experiences can pale in comparison. I've spent over five years in German concentration camps. So when things like this happen, I compare it to the other, and it loses the horror. These, after all, are the ashes of all things replaceable, unlike these. They're the heroes who reshaped world history, but we're losing them fast. World War II veterans are dying at a rate of 1,000 per day. Over the last decade, the Greatest Generations Foundation has transported hundreds of World War II heroes to places like Normandy, Pearl Harbor, and Iwo Jima, places where they proudly served and still serve today as living history lessons. To honor them and help us carry out this mission before it's too late, please visit us at tggf.org. When we think of the Holocaust, of course, the first place we think of is here, Auschwitz. The death toll here was more than that of all of U.S. and British forces combined during the entire war. Here, the deception for the Jews started at the very front gate with those words that said, work will set you free. 
It is a lie cantor Zachary Kuttner of Denver was told firsthand. The 90-year-old has served as a well-known cantor or song leader at a synagogue in Denver for decades, renowned for his voice. But as a 17-year-old boy in Auschwitz, he was voiceless, powerless, nameless, too. He wasn't known as Zachary there. He was known by a number. A17630. Numerals etched on his arm in fading ink since the day he arrived at the death camp. He and the others were divided into two lines that day, like so many before them. Those on the right headed to the camp hospital, those on the left unknowingly bound immediately for the gas chamber. He was lined up on the left, but something told him to change places at the last moment. I say it in Yiddish first, we God will not get. We God wants me to go there, I'm going. And I stood to the right. Right there, didn't move. From that day, his faith has been unshaken, even when he came face to face with the chief camp physician at Auschwitz. And naturally, we went to Mengele. Joseph Mengele, the angel of death, they called him, who performed torturous medical experiments on Jewish prisoners, often maiming them or killing them. He was one of the doctors who decided, often on a whim, who was gassed and who was spared. Zachary Kuttner survived Mangala's cruel selection process at least six times. Why did God want him to live? It is a question he has asked too many times to count since leaving Auschwitz. Maybe it's to help give others hope all these decades later. He says it's fairly well known in the Jewish community. If you need a blessing, talk to a Holocaust survivor because they have been truly blessed themselves, even if they can't quite explain why them. I was picked to survive. God picked me to survive. Why? I don't know. of a winter snowfall can nearly blind you to the grotesque history here. This is Sobibor extermination camp in eastern Poland where we traveled earlier this year. One of the few reminders of that grotesque history is that pyramid-shaped camp memorial, a mound of sand mixed with the ashes of some of the quarter million Jews who were executed here. But the dense trees that surround this camp stand in tribute to a group of Jews who defied all odds and survived the Holocaust in an unbelievable way. You know, I hope nothing like that ever happens again. Paula Berger of Denver was one of them, just seven years old when the Nazis invaded her hometown in Poland in July 1941. Within days, neighbors and friends were being murdered. It wasn't long before her family got a knock on their door. They were being sent to a Jewish ghetto. Basically, we were prisoners, except we didn't commit any crimes. Here in these ghettos, families were ripped apart. Her father escaped to join a small resistance group fighting the Nazis called the Belsky Partisans. And her mother? One day, while Paula was out playing, her mom was hauled off by the Gestapo and never seen again. My mother, before she was taken away, I don't know if she had a premonition or she just was trying to, to do whatever she could to safeguard us, sat me down next to her, put her arm around me and said, if something happens to me, you should take care of Isaac. I was eight. Isaac was her three-year-old brother, and together with the help of their dad's friend, they would make a daring escape that kept them alive. My father got this friend of his who was bringing in supplies to the ghetto. He put us in a barrel, in a wet barrel, so they, they put me and my brother with a blanket. My job was to keep him quiet. He drove us out of the ghetto. Had they stopped us, they would have shot us and him too. And he knew that. But you know, sometimes people do really kind things under horrible circumstances. Horrible circumstances, the only way to describe how they survived the next two years out here in the deepest forests of Poland. They joined that resistance group their dad was fighting with, the Belsky Partisans. 1,200 Jews, most of them escapees of the ghettos and concentration camps, out here hiding in the woods. And that was the first time I saw Jewish people without a yellow star sewn on their clothes. And people looked at us 
kind of sad. It was a sad look, not that they meant us any harm or anything, but they all lost their children. With very little to eat, they slept in bunkers, holes in the frozen ground, and they were constantly on the move to avoid being discovered. Anybody could hand, hand us over and get a reward. One day, two Germans on a motorcycle spotted them and opened fire. Her father's friend saved her. His back was grazed by a bullet. That would have been my bullet had he not grabbed me just in time. Timing. It has always seemed to be on Paula's side, and the timing of the Russian tanks she saw barreling across her forest home in July 1944 couldn't have been better. And once we realized there were Russian tanks, that was a great relief. And they told us we were liberated. Just like that, it was over. That little girl, now free. But her childhood innocence was gone forever. Still, though, that promise to her mom to protect her little brother was kept. I mean, I tried to be the best I could, but I was eight years old. So even in my mind, I took care of him. It's not the same as a mother. Nothing was ever the same as it was before. Paula did finally go to school. Her family eventually moved to Chicago, and she later settled down here in Denver. That little brother, not so little anymore and the father who fought so hard to keep them both alive lived another 30 years before he passed back in 1975. He's now buried here in Colorado. See the Rocky Mountains behind there? As for Paula, she's now 82 years old and she's an artist. It's not the same. Her art inspired by her past and her loss. Those experiences that happened so long ago and so far away that she still can't quite explain. You know what? There are people that are a lot smarter than me that can't figure it out either. It's one of those little breaks in history that humanity fails itself. Every year, for one single day, they gather again at Auschwitz. Ladies and gentlemen, may the candles we place at the monument be a sign of our eternal remembrance. You can recognize them in the crowd by their time-withered faces and, of course, by the Holocaust prisoner stripes many of them still wear as a reminder. These are the people who somehow made it out of the concentration camps alive. Hard to imagine what it's like to be back here again. I'm crying all the time. If you, you know you see me, I'm crying and hold it inside. Asher Ode first came to Auschwitz as a teenage boy after his family was already torn apart. My father was sent in the beginning when the German come in, and since then he disappeared, and I don't know any more about him. He now returns frequently to share the story of what it was like to live through Auschwitz. Where was God? when everybody was walking here and they were taking them to burn them. Where was God? Judith Haas may question her faith, but she will never question her obligation to relive the horrors of 70 years ago. She lives in Miami now, but as a little girl, her family outran the Nazis by crisscrossing the Polish countryside, going to Russia, but not before witnessing things in a Jewish ghetto that still haunt her. They shot a pregnant woman in front of everybody and then they shot 20 Jewish people because they were trying to help somebody. Ask nearly any Holocaust survivor and they'll tell you we must bear witness. It is their duty to talk about it, a living tribute to the dead. The kids, young children who had no idea what would soon happen to them. The teenagers, old enough to know the short and grim future that awaited in a place where the average lifespan was just two weeks. The adults, dragged from their everyday lives and doomed for no other reason than their race and religion. It is a message not lost on the young Americans we ran into in Poland, trying to learn more about how this happened. To understand that you're standing in the same place, thousands, almost a million people have died, and 
it's just a crazy thought to feel like you're alive, like you're here and you're standing in the same place that they are. One American teenager told us coming here to places like this, seeing the old broken buildings, staring at the memorials, walking this sacred ground is an experience she will never forget, which is exactly the point. I'm Jeremy Hubbard reporting tonight from Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp in Poland. Thanks for joining us.